This video is going to be an overview of kaplan meier survivorship curves, and I did a video that was just kind of laying the groundwork for uh, survival analysis in general, and that one would be good to watch first, uh, just because I'm just going to be talking about kaplan meier here and not as much about just kind of like the, the basics. So this is a kaplan meier survivorship curve. Uh, typically, cumulative survival probability is plotted on the y-axis going from one when everyone's alive and as uh, deaths or whatever the event is is occurring uh, the probability of survival is going down accordingly um, you'll notice that the, the uh, time intervals here aren't consistent uh, because whenever an event occurs that's when these dips are happening uh, kaplan meyer curves are able to account for censoring that's what these dashes are here um, and yeah so a kaplan meyer table can be used to ultimately uh, come up with these, like what's plotted on the y-axis here. I'm, I'm gonna go over how each of these points are calculated. Um, so we call each of these um, time points J, J1, 2, and 3 for time points 1, 2, and 3. And it's not going up as far as the actual time in, in regular intervals. It's just whenever an event happens to occur rj here is the uh, number at risk at time j d is the number of deaths occurring at time j and w is the number of withdrawals or censoring that's occurring then and you'll hear that the, you're, you'll see that the number at risk is going down um, by the number of deaths and withdrawals so there was one death one withdrawal so it went down by two one death and two withdrawals so it went from 10 to 7. Um, the first thing we calculate is q J, which is uh, the uh, risk of the event at this time, which is the number of deaths over the number at risk, which is just the proportion of um, those who had the event among those that were eligible. Uh, so 1 over 12 comes out to 0 0.083, and you can do that for the rest. Um, the next is the probability of survival, which is just the complement of the probability of the event. So uh, 1 minus probability of the event comes out to 0 0.92 for this one and um, yeah can be calculated the same way for the rest um, the cumulative probability of survival for that first row it's the same um, it's just multiplying the the probability of survival at each time because um, this is just the the classic multiplication rule for um, probabilities where the probability of, of two things happening um, is just the the product of, of the first thing happening and the second thing happening. Um, so the probability of surviving to time two is the probability of surviving at time one multiplied by the probability of surviving at time two. So it comes up to 0 0.83. And that's basically what's plotted here. Uh, the x-axis here is time and uh, the y-axis here is probability of survival. It's going down in um, increments that are like I said before, come from uh, the amount of uh, deaths or events at that time divided by the number at risk, um, and also taking withdrawals into account as the number at risk in the next interval gets rid of those withdrawals. Um, and yeah, it's it's going down each time uh, because you're multiplying something less than one each time, and when you multiply something by something less than one, it has to decrease. Uh, to the point that the probability of surviving to the end was zero. That doesn't always happen. Um, you can end up with people left in the study who uh, like didn't have the event by the time follow-up ended and at that point you're not you're not able to make any interpretations about what happened here but you're able to go up until the information you do have. Um, instead of plotting uh, survival you can plot cumulative incidents. I should have gotten rid of this, just ignore that. Um, but plotting cumulative incidents, it's basically just uh, taking one minus the probability of survival is the probability of death or the probability of the event. And instead of uh, descending downwards, it climbs upwards. So some assumptions for kaplan meier are that uh, censoring is independent of survival. So those who uh, dropped out of the study early didn't drop out for reasons that are related to the outcome, so didn't drop out because they're really sick. Um, and also there's no major trends over calendar time, so um, 
those who uh yeah those those who uh have the event earlier are not at a higher risk of those who have the event later risk is assumed to be kind of constant over time um, and yeah, that's something that can be addressed if that's not the case by uh, stratifying by calendar time. So some ways that first assumption can be violated that people are dropping out at random is like I said, if people are sicker, drop out. Also, if people are dying of other diseases, um, you it, it typically if say the time, event we were looking at for time to event was dying of a heart attack, if you died of something else, that's technically a withdrawal because you didn't, you didn't die of the outcome of interest. Um, but if the outcome was, say, uh, like I said, heart disease and, and someone died of lung cancer, technically they didn't die of the disease of interest, but they also died of something that's kind of related to the exposure. Say smoking is related to both. If they, this person died of lung cancer, smoking is related to both what we're interested in and this other thing this person died from so that could be a problem that could be a reason that people are dropping out for reasons that aren't random also people migrating away from where the study is located and, and not able to participate because they live in a different town now that might be a function of socioeconomic status where maybe people of some socioeconomic status are able to to pick up and move elsewhere whilst others aren't and uh, some violations of uh, number two, which is that uh, calen um, risk is the same over calendar time. A way that can be violated is if there was some novel therapy that uh, that came to be that all of these people were maybe given, and, and then all of a sudden the uh, risk becomes lower in some uh, time period of follow-up as a function of calendar time, where you have a different risk before and after this therapy came into into implementation. So don't worry too much about this. This is just showing you that confidence intervals can be calculated for Kaplan-Meier curves, and that's something software would do. But uh, you can see that there's a confidence band now around our, our Kaplan-Meier function. And this is what Kaplan-Meier data looks like, like what you would input into SAS, um, where you have people's treatment status treated or, or not treated the number of years they were followed and why they stopped being followed. So one means that um, they are followed for one year and no further, and that's because they were censored. And this person was followed for six years and no further. And because it's a zero, they're not censored. And the alternative is that they had the event, basically. Um, yeah, so you could have uh, done this differently, or you could have had like event, and then one means they had the event, and, and zero means they were censored. But this is kind of conventional that you have um, censorship as as the positive version of this dummy variable. Yeah. Um, so now you can have uh, two survival functions uh, comparing treated and untreated. Um, and I don't know if it's exactly related. These it's just yeah. I'm not sure if this table aligns with this, but basically yeah, that's how it would look if you had two survival functions plotted together. And using what we learned about confidence intervals, you can see that <laughs> that kind of gives you what you need for a hypothesis test where you can see if these confidence intervals overlap. That's an indication that these uh, two groups are um, different, or sorry, that if they overlap, it's, it's evidence that there's not enough evidence to uh, say that there are different lines. Um, but a more quantitative way of doing that is the log rank test. And the log rank test uh, takes these two curves and um, plots a hazard function. So hazard's more complicated than this, but for the Kaplan-Meier curve, we just take it as the number of events at time j over the uh, number at risk at time j. So we're able to plot, uh, calculate the hazard at each of these time points for the two groups. And you basically have a, a null hypothesis that the, the hazard of the two groups is the same. Um, so now we're able to plot its negative log hazard. We're able to plot uh, that it, uh, yeah, we're able to plot the hazard function for this red group. Forget if that's treated or untreated. Doesn't really matter. Um, and basically, the hypothesis, null hypothesis, is that these two lines are the same. And now we have um, a hypothesis that's capable of being rejected. And if it is, that means that um, these 
two curve these two lines are different and that means survivorship among the treated and untreated group is different it can it's problematic if they cross um, because if they spend about the same amount of time below each other as above each other if one spends about as much time below the other one and above the other one that's going to kind of cancel each other out and the way the the, the uh, test statistic is calculated might result in um, this being determined that they're the same line even though they're they're pretty clearly different lines but yeah this uh, test statistic doesn't do very well if the lines cross uh, also with Kaplan Meier you can compare more than two groups it doesn't just need to be two and also you can do a stratified analysis analysis where um, your null hypothesis is based on the stratum so you have say this uh, this confounder has two strata, like smoking or non-smoking or something. Um, you're able to compare that uh, the hazards of the treated and non-treated group are the same among the smoking strata and uh, the same among the non-smoking strata, but uh, it doesn't necessarily, it's, it's able to be stratified by smoking, so that isn't uh, influencing the relationship here.